Hello, my name is Dave Gonzalez, and I haven't read any of the books in George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire. I'm Joanna Robinson. I've read every book in George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire. And I'm Neil Miller, and I have also read all of those books. We are headed back to Westeros to cover the Game of Thrones spinoff series, House of the Dragon. We'll be answering your questions, so send us a raven at trialbycontent at gmail.com. Take some bread and salt and join us Thursdays on the Trial by Content feed. And don't worry, you're safe. The Reigns of Castamere hasn't even been written yet. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking, or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023, I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago, and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your Life, terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually, we're great, but together, we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com, A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com. Atlassian. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. Hey guys, Andy here. Quick note before we get into today's show. Uh, Chris is still on vacation, the lucky bastard, and uh, he's having a great time on the East Coast, which is absolutely fine. I'm not jealous in any way, but wanted to let you know that he was kind enough to record with me in advance half of today's show talking about this week's episode of Industry. It was Season two, episode three, aired Monday night. We loved it so much we had to talk. We were going to talk 10 minutes. I think it's closer to 20 or 30, but we love the show. So that's going to be the first part of the show, replete with a classic CR intro and everything. At the end, you'll hear him say, uh, probably with some genuine trepidation in his voice, uh, he has no idea what I'm going to do next. I think he predicted the worst. We'll see whether he was right or not, but I am not forcing you all on a return visit to Daddington Island. Instead, since we already did a lot on an episode of Industry, I thought we could just do some more contemporary television show talk. So I will be talking a little bit about the new Amazon Prime series, A League of Their Own, as well as the latest Marvel offering on the Disney Plus service, She-Hulk, which premiered uh, late last night or today, Thursday. So we got three new shows to talk about with you. You'll hear me and Chris on Industry and then your boy flying solo, talking A League of Their Own and She-Hulk. Let's get into today's episode of The Watch. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line, he answers to the man who pays. It's Andy Greenwald! What's up, buddy? We're, we're doing a little time machining right now. So we're recording this in the future. Uh, Andy, it's the previous week. I'll be on vacation when people hear this, but we wanted to get together to talk about the third episode of Industry. Uh, the episode is called The Fool. Folks know how we feel about this show, so we wanted to make sure we kept hitting it every week. Greenwald, you look great. How you doing? I feel great. I'm really excited to talk about the show. I feel like episode two of season two of Industry, which was amazing, got a little bit of short shrift. Because it had the misfortune of airing the same night as the penultimate episode of Better Call Saul, which Mm -hmm. definitely caused show creators Mickey Down and Conrad K to cheekily tweak me for posting something on Instagram about how Monday night featured one of the best episodes of television of the decade. (laughs) Um, But you know what? I like the moxie. I like the moxie. I appreciate the, the, the high heat because they're delivering. They're delivering. We didn't really give that episode to full the full force of our attention because of the Saul uh, episode, but also because we had talked to Mickey and Conrad the week before and kind of alluded to some of the amazing things that happened at the end of it. But I would actually argue that this episode is a little bit superior, and maybe it's superior because it is building on the incredible momentum of that last scene. But this was a total joy and a total pleasure beginning to end. Yeah, let me tell you something. And we're we're spoiling this episode going forward. So if you haven't watched yet, obviously check that out. Uh, 
Poor when, Kaya. She hasn't watched it yet. And sorry, Kaya. She can't when check it out. They do the smash cut from Eric in the hunting lodge mm. calling Harper and she, or it goes straight to voicemail. And then they smash cut to the exact same framing of Harper on the Pierpont floor pre open. I'm like, this show's better than The Sopranos. <laughs> 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 when, when the talking heads needle drop Well, hits? you know, because they said to us, because Mickey and Conrad, when they came on, they were talking about how they wanted some of the banking, specifically the banking scene, the, the scene from the end of episode two where Rishi mm-hmm. is yelling about cucks. They wanted that to feel like the bank robbery in Heat. And that scene at the end of episode three felt like when Will Graham figures out Hannibal Lecter and Manhunter. You know, like, I, I really do feel like there was like a feeling in my bloodstream when that cut yes. hit and that last two minutes of her getting Rishi to execute the sale or execute the deal where Jesse Bloom basically takes over Rikan, this telehealth business that has been at the center of the first few episodes. And up into including one of my favorite needle drops in TV history, which is this must be the place by the talking heads coming on. I don't know. I, I'm, just, I'm just so over the moon about this. I, I got to be honest with you and with our listeners and with everybody like like people know we love the show. And mm-hmm. I was going to say my concern was getting a little in front of our skis, both because the show is primarily about people skiing in the colloquial sense. <laughs> in the Craigslist also, sense. Yeah. Yeah. But also the yeah, early 2000s Craigslist sense. Um, but for people who don't know, also, that was like a big thing where it was like <laughs> the, the urban legend that you could buy cocaine on Craigslist by looking up skiing as a search term. But also people would get real like people would post things just like, you know, looking to go cross country this weekend with a few trusted friends, yeah. you know, and be like, really? Because I, I would like to get some exercise, but also I would like to make friends in Vermont. Um, anyway, because we really obviously look, we like Mickey and Conrad a lot. We love the first season of the show. And I have to admit that when I press play on the, the season premiere, I was a little bit like Rishi at the end of the last episode. Now, was I... Uh, screaming at everyone around me. No, thankfully, I turned it on alone. But I did feel a lot of stress. Like, was this going to deliver? Were we going to be able to execute? Were the buyers and sellers going to find common ground here? And the moments at the end of the second episode where it suddenly came together and became that Michael Mann car chase scene, but in an office block in the city, in London, like, I felt so relieved. I felt great. And this just built on it. I thought that just from a construction perspective, this was a brilliantly architected episode of TV. It was really interesting to watch this after our conversation with them about, you know, trying to lean into TV conventions. We've heard both Mickey and Conrad refer to watching or rewatching some of their favorite shows, whether it's, um, you know, Mad Men, they reference a lot. I felt some Succession vibes on this in the best possible way, because the main lesson from Succession, <laughs> other than maybe make a decision about your children's inheritance, sure. to me is <laughs> long term family event, planning. <laughs> yeah. Have an event every week. Yeah, You know what I mean? I mean, if you can, like, take people out of their, off their squares, put guns in their hand if possible, and then let it fly and see what happens. And my feeling, and then we can get into the specifics of the episode, but I just want to say, like, there's nothing that is humming at this level right now for me, just in terms of pleasure and excitement and anticipation, aesthetics too, which are just immaculate, like the title yeah, card I dropping mean, over Harper masturbating well high on a bathroom floor. I mean, chef's kiss. But I just want to say, Chris, this is a reference that you'll get. I don't know if our listeners will, but making an obscure reference to something cultural from the UK feels right in this moment. You remember the all-time great Steve Coogan as Alan Partridge clip where he's doing the World Cup highlights, yeah. but he doesn't understand soccer? And he's like a just, traction engine, yeah. When he just shouts liquid football? Yeah. Is that that's how, how I about? that's how I feel watching these guys talk about like you know high end yield hedge fund trading or whatever like I don't know what the fuck they're talking about but I know poetry when I hear it. Let's stick with not knowing what the fuck you're talking about because I think that what they're doing here is also kind of a a masterpiece of density. Shows can be very explicit about what they're about, like, and I don't mean what they're about, like it's about a cop looking for a murderer or something like that. I mean they can be very explicit about like the themes of the show, like. The show is very obviously putting forward the ideas about uh, class in the UK, but also in the Western world in general. It's uh, putting forward ideas about sobriety. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, as being called an intoxicant is quite an, a character summation uh, by Rob. 
uh, there's ideas about what you owe people in a professional setting versus what you owe them in a personal setting and what happens when the line between those two things collapse. It's about ambition. It's about all these different things. And then it's also about this very, very, probably in terms of if you've worked at Goldman or if you've worked at Merrill or if you've worked at these places, like the right hand deal is, is pretty obvious to you. But I think for a layman is probably just like, what the fuck is happening? But they can do the dense jargon filled version of that. And then they can also do Harper's choosing between Jesse yes. and Eric. Eric has already chosen Fellum. Like chosen Fellum. There are these other players, this Anna woman who is obviously advocating for more of like a socially conscious, socially minded uh, version of this business than the actual owner of the business wants. And you can see that all play out. And for me, it's like, even though obviously there are are blank spots, to say the least, about like the level of, my level of understanding of what's happening, I get it. You know, I never don't get it. And I guess that's the, that's yeah. the, that's the real testament to what they've written. Yeah, I think it works. I mean, and we should get into some of the interpersonal character stuff that was done just expertly in this episode. Um, but, you know, the, the show is well-named and we've talked before about how people who don't work in this specific industry can find things to recognize or relate to. You know, when the season premiered, I was comparing it a little bit to the bear. I mean, there's something that's very specific that happens when you work closely with people under strenuous conditions, which is basically a job, I guess, in the 21st century. The romance goes away real fast. Emotion gets leached out of things really, really quickly. And you find yourself talking about things that once held kind of glittery potential or hope the way you would be talking about widgets or chess pieces or whatever. And this episode, the language used to talk about healthcare and then the way that healthcare actually played a part in the episode, albeit minor, right? Fellum gets some buckshot in the face, thanks to Jesse, who it must be noted, was taking aim during cocktail hour at a legally protected rare bird and instead wings off Fellum's glasses. He then talks about how, you know, even though he is a billionaire, he has to wait in line at the NHS, right? And then we have the new character who Gus ends up pairing off with at the end for conversation who says that, you know, she's the, she's the compassionate Tory. Mm -hmm. And they all talk about what can pass and what can be, what can be accepted by the public when you bring in, begin to consider the privatization of healthcare and all of it. And it's, it's, it's like they're batting around a dead mouse, right? There is no moment in this where they are talking about, you know, people's actual lives or well-being. And it's just an expertly drawn metaphor for who these people are when they only feel alive when they've taken all of the humanity out of something. Yeah. You know, it's really, it's, it was just so remarkably done and done, and especially in this episode with such an expertly chosen cast of characters in a particularly funny and at least for American audiences, very disconcerting setting. <laughs> yes. I mean, even for, and, and did you, what did you think of the way that they brought Gus kind of back into the fold? Because he's not in the first episode, I don't believe, yeah. or maybe he, he briefly. Like, I think he opens the door at the end. Like he, he is the is the new roommate. We see his blue hair. Right. I, I texted you this. Like I, I'm thrilled with Gus's usage rate this season. You know, shout out to Kevin Pelton and John Hollinger and whatever other NBA <laughs> st statisticians. I don't. That's right. I don't know how to credit, but I thought probably like many that he was off the show this season because he 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 bombed out of of Pure Point at the end of last season. I'm loving his presence Yeah, I don't know why here. I keep calling it Pierpont. It's Pierpoint. And maybe that's the American pronunciation. Pierpont's the people who run my money, actually. Oh, oh do you really? <laughs> because they took the I out of it? That's right. And it's really more of a team thing? <laughs> yeah, it's sort of a... <laughs> it's a great pivot. I, I really appreciate and respect that. Um, I like having a character, first of all, who is human at the moment. Uh, yeah. Although we see his, his eyes light up with a certain, you know, the cold light of ambition again at the end of this one. But... I just am enjoying his energy. And I think another smart thing about the season is the way that sobriety is becoming kind of a theme yeah. of the show in general with the way that, you know, the, the currents can change in mid swim. And so like the Yasmin scene with Kenny and what's Maximo or something, the, the, the basically she, Rocco. she's trying to, it's basically Rocco. she's rock. Uh, Maxim is the, the guy who was handling oh. her family's money, who she's developed, started a relationship with, but she's at that in that scene with Kenny and Rocco, and they're supposed to be talking about, uh, and, and she's crypto. poaching almost. Yeah. I, but I, like the thing that's fascinating about that scene is how her currency is her ability, obviously like to speak not only literally many languages, but to 
you know, move within mm-hmm. the circles of these sort of moneyed, almost aristocratic families. And then the thing is, is that the one language being spoken at that table, well, the two languages being spoken mm-hmm. at that table are NFTs and bored apes and Dogecoin, which is just like, I don't know, and the language of sobriety. And are you a friend of Bill? You know, like, do you know my friend Bill? And it's just amazing how she can go from I'm the insider, I'm the person who has like the the inside track here to I have no idea what you guys are talking about. My drinking almost seems gauche at this point. I'm the person showing up at Rob's house and doing bumps yeah. now. Like she is spiraling out a little bit trying to find herself. The show has a really um I think smart and intuitive angle on people's behavior good and bad. And what I mean is like you know the show begins in a really terrific place basically celebrating the triumph of the heat bank robbery scene at the end of the last episode. And we see Rishi and Harper doing some, you know, I think Olympic level slaloming in a public bathroom. And I'm reminded again that one of the triumphs of the show is that Harper is ostensibly the lead and she's a total mess. And she's also a genius. Yeah. And I love that or the show she? doesn't I mean, that's the thing that Rob, well, the Rob, Rob, the Rob summarizes her perfectly also. where she's yeah. like, you know, she's just so gifted or whatever. And he's like, is she? Or does she just never take her foot off the gas? And the fact, I mean, again, I credit Mickey and Conrad a lot for allowing the characters to be both. I think that's a really challenging thing to do. And I mean that in an empathetic way because we love these characters. I'm sure they love these characters too. And there's just a tendency in all TV to just kind of drift towards everyone's good because we love them and we want them to be good. And I love that the show is committed to making sure that they are whole and entire people. But in terms of the sobriety, like it can be very seductive when you're in a world where everybody is doing one thing to assume that that's the norm. And the show sometimes puts us in that world, like the party in the season premiere where rich people are just absolutely not uh, worried about COVID and Yasmin meets, um, I'm blanking on her name, the Celeste. private wealth woman, Celeste, and thinks she's a, a, a sex worker. But literally everyone in that room is speaking the same language. And it's and it's, and it's the language of the Winter Olympics. As soon as you are outnumbered in a situation, as Yasmin is at that table, it all seems, yeah. as you said, it seems, it, it seems off. It doesn't seem right. you know. And so it's just another currency that's at play here. And having Rob now be sober and be willing to go to bed and to walk away from the opportunity he's been looking for in this time, potentially not involving devouring broken glass is really significant and strong choice for the character. You can't get your footing, right? And that's something that I like. Yeah, it's also awesome to sort of start to see pathologies of characters develop that are not necessarily written in as like character backstories. So specifically... Mm. You know, Harper, obviously, there's some stuff with her brother. There's, like, stuff with her background and where she comes from that is, like, evident on the screen. And then there's stuff that starts to develop just because if you watch this character for now our, what, like, 12 or whatever we're on Mm -hmm. here. I don't know that this person is is a person who can function when she's not crying, screaming, and throwing up. You know, like, it seems like the the optimal place or the place that she finds her like her chi is when everything is cranked up to volume 11 moving Mm -hmm. at 90 miles per hour and the fate of the world is resting on her shoulders and whether or not Rishi is going to execute this block trade for her or whatever and I don't know that she was it's it's interesting to sort of like think about the year that she's in this hotel room and wonder, like, I wonder if she's just like clinically depressed because she's not mm-hmm. holding a knife to Eric's throat the entire time, you know, or or juggling Jesse Bloom's like forty billion dollars. I, I think it's notable that she is one million percent endorphin deficient. Yes, when she gets on the train uh, to go to this event, this shoot. There's really only two what, options great, at that moment. Great, great seating arrangement for her. The best possible <laughs> like seat. <laughs> what, on like, the train? Where the guy from right can is like, make sure you take out page 27 of this deck. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it should have gone to the quiet car, my guy. I know. Um, you know, it, it, I, I don't think it takes any, I don't think it takes someone with experience with Harper's previous evening to understand that there are really only two paths. Like you can go to sleep for 48 hours or you can try to climb the mountain again yeah. and she doesn't have drugs handy but what she does have is this killer instinct right and the endorphins that come from from doing this where do you feel let's do a spot check just like the Harper Eric relationship yeah. is moving very very fast and in 
there are a lot of cross currents because the pen scene, first of all, just great. That's just great TV writing that he mm-hmm. gives her the pen and then Jesse needs the pen. Uh, and it che- becomes yeah. not a, it's not a gift. It's a memento, memento Mori. It's great. I would stuff, say Chekhov's but, pen, but it's like, is it Hobbesian pens? I don't know. Like <laughs> It's Hobbes. It's Hobbes's pen. So do you, but do you, that was a significant scene on some level as typical of the characters. There's some generosity and there's also some check yourself in it. Where are we with this dynamic and where else can it go? I mean, this is the third episode of the second season of a show the, the guys told us themselves that the Harper-Eric dynamic, whether it was intentional or, or not, was the spine of season one. And I think it's wise to diversify the portfolio, so to speak. But it is in seemingly a, a, I don't know how you come, in, I mean, obviously you can come back from this and you can go on, but it does seem like this is a fatal blow. Well, it kind of reminds me a little bit of some of the ways in which we talked about, and I won't give anything away for this series, but the way that we talked about Lalo on Better Call Saul. Um, Mm. And it's like, the temptation is probably there in the writer's room for industry to have a Harper Eric blow up every episode because there's something electric that comes off of those two performers when they are matched up against one another. And I think that you could could easily, I, I mean, to my eyes, at least, it feels like they are burning through Eric plot, right? Like, there is obviously plenty of stuff that we can still learn about Eric, but I don't know how many moves he has left here, which isn't to say that, you know, I don't understand really what somebody's boss at a place like Pierpoint does anyway, but it does, doesn't it feel as though like mm-hmm. what's happening between Harper and Eric is something that we almost waited the entirety of season one for and has now happened twice in season two. And it doesn't seem like after this sale is executed, Eric's going to have like much, I mean, he might have recourse, but I don't know where their relationship goes. Yeah. I, my, my feeling about this, especially what happens at the very end of the episode is if, in if the end of the previous episode was Michael Mann's heat, the end of this episode was Michael Mann's last of the Mohicans where Harper has literally <laughs> reached into Eric's chest cavity and eaten his right. heart in front of him. Um, what's interesting and about the, the rest Eric of, character. The rest of the series is yeah. Michael Mann's Miami Vice. Please. And, and by that, you mean the cinematic exploration of the, of the theme, <laughs> yeah. right? It's just all go fast boats and bloated Colin Farrell. God, what a masterpiece. Okay, but the Eric character is one of my favorites on the show and one of the most compelling and Ken Lung's performance is, is awesome. Um, I really liked the way th- that they hid the ball about his personal life, such as it is until the back half of the that last grocery season. store scene. Yeah. Where she sees um, him with his, with his daughter. He's like a normal person. He is, he appears to be uniquely vulnerable, which again is a good place for drama to start, but he basically only got his job back because of Harper right? And now the DVD guy is in from America and all of America is looking at London. And she basically just X'd out his richest and most yes. capable As Rishi says, if we, if we rock Fellum again here, he's never going to do business with us again. And as Fellum himself says, like, so now if you can't do business for me, all we have is your, what is your personality and, and character. You know, good luck with that yeah. character. Good luck with that. He was like, nice knowing um, you for a time. For a time. These guys are all monsters. Yeah. Um, well, he did yeah, get it's shot an interesting in the face. place to be. I mean, I'm sure he was like, <laughs> he did get shot in the face. And when we talk to the to Mickey and Conrad again, I just want to commend them for that because that felt to me like the kind of thing that you pitch to your writing partner or to your writer's room at the end of an afternoon when you've sort of done incremental half steps of things that could happen. The idea of the character who is doesn't like the other one shooting him in the face, yeah, Dick Cheney style, <laughs> is the boldest choice and thus. Uh, the best choice. I also, by the way, just putting in a sidebar, will make a request to them that when they're back, they could just read us all of the outtakes of things for mean things to say about crypto, because <laughs> that it's just a like a momentary throwaway before Kenny's just like, yeah, I got into that shit. But like, it's great. It's great stuff. Is it my imagination or is there because they've gotten to the point now where it's not just the Rishi lines that are said off screen, but like punched in so that they're almost like yeah. narrating. But like, didn't somebody say when Felon gets shot, like someone download the right can app? <laughs> well, yeah, but someone was just like, do we have any doctors here? Yeah. Or is everyone just finance? <laughs> also, by the way, you know, it's not as if I wasn't already in the tank for the show, but the Yaz uh, Kenny scene at the, the bar at the restaurant does begin with just like essentially uh, SpawnCon 
for Aubon Climat, one of my favorite wineries in Santa Barbara. So shout out to them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's uh, that's fantastic. And I hope that it it merits a response. You the mentioned winery. the aesthetics of the show. I just uh, I want to just mention Nathan McKay's score because oh, uh, so good. there will just be like the most ordinary shot of like Yasmin sitting at a table waiting for Celeste to walk into an office, but like the score is playing and I'm like, this is more beautiful than when like Richard <laughs> Gear Gear ran across a field of wheat in Days of Heaven. <laughs> yes, but Chris, now they know that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Because they dropped it with a Yasmin Rob scene where I'm like, oh my God, like young love run free. Like this is going to happen. Like they just bought tickets to Bone Town and, and then the music drops laughing. out and they just start laughing. Yeah. Well done. Well yeah, done. Yasmin's dad? Like, it, good dad, oh yeah, bad so this dad? Is what I, this is what I want to talk about. <laughs> Daddy to Nyland. Um, first of all, one of us needs to adopt him as our fashion icon. It's all you, Doug. And I don't mean I'm into wearing lycra pants in disrespectful ways at professional business meetings, but there was something incredible about the workout clothes. It's not even athleisure, because we've talked before, and now I think we're a little older, we respect it, that when one of our heroes, the great Greg Dooley from, from, from uh, Afghan Wigs and Twilight Singers came into the studio to pod with us, and he was just wearing like tearaway pants like an NBA player, and I was Dude, like... You don't have to talk me into that look. He's earned it. He's you know I it. just want to dress like Jurgen Klopp every day. <laughs> <laughs> so this... But this guy, it was, it's the head, it, it was the sort of like in-ear, like workout earbuds. Yeah, it's just like the draped beats the that neck. he has like around the neck, Yeah. Oh, it's legendary. It's legendary. Um, so, I'm sorry, you want to go back to good dad, bad dad? Is that, is that really, is this how you're teeing me up? Because no, remember, I, we're airing this a week after I just did 45-minute monologues Dude, if you do, if you do 45 Bluey. minutes on Bluey, this, this pod's going to be on Patreon before I get back from vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be, be like, doing very well. We're going to be like like public broadcasting, like asking for <laughs> listener donations every quarter. Uh, what else was I going to ask you? Oh, I wanted to just quickly do a Duplass check. Is, there, is, is the free gift for a certain donation the Pure Point Ski Club tote bag? <laughs> yeah, Apre Ski. Um, mm-hmm. J Duplass is is just awesome. Fucking Michael Claytoning the button here. Like, what's going on? <laughs> well, first of all, he is a great actor, as we said, and it's so fun watching him be a great actor because it's like watching someone realize they could be a great actor it reminds me of like and we talked about this in a different context but like the great show quantum leap when scott bacula would jump into someone's body and then be able to do the thing that the character could do like that's kind of the feeling i get watching jay duplass be like yeah i'm fucking here let's go but i just think and maybe this is a projection i mean he's a smart guy so this doesn't necessarily need to be magic but he is himself a writer and director and gets good writing, good language, and also good vibes. You know what I mean? Like he, I think he understands the show that he was joining. Yeah. And so I, it doesn't I would also, feel... I, mean, I have no idea if they shot this like in order necessarily or what was block shot or anything from episode to episode, but it does feel like he's getting more and more comfortable with the rhythms of the language of this show with every episode. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's just me getting used to him saying it. There's also just little touches with his character, like him taking his shoes off when he goes into Harper's room. That's just like, that is like a little bit like it's a, a split second but it's like great writing because or it's great performing if that was jay duplass's idea like to be like what if he did this because he trusts like he's showing her like vulnerability by being like i'm just a guy with my, my socks drinking a beer also he's he's an american and she's an american and neither of them feel like they belong there but they but they in some ways but they know that they do because they have either the skills or frankly the cash to play and so they're not going to go by rules and i thought that was another interesting Uh, Or not by rules, but by tradition. So I thought that was interesting too, where of the primary four um, that were sparring in the episode, Phelim and Eric are a team. And Eric is also an American. Yeah. The point where he says, you know, it's a weird island. But he does believe in some old traditions and old rules and suddenly is, you know, basically... He's the one being like, oh, you don't ask people how many birds they've shot. Right. How do you you think you would do in in a shoot? I'd probably catch buckshot in the face. Like if I have to be honest, like no. I also, I'm just very un- unaware of like my surroundings in that regard. Like I would probably be like wandering out into the middle of the shooting part. Uh, but in terms of just being able to hang, you know, I think I'd be fine. I, I think you'd be, f- I want to say this. I've said this bef- uh, before about you in other contexts. I, you know, and I love you telehealth. Can, you, <laughs> you can, you can hang though. You know, I've told the story, but like one of the great sites of hanging out with young Chris in the early 2000s was going to a Phillies game 
and having a little time between like waiting, you know, getting the Tony Luke's roast pork sandwich and like sitting down to watch uh, Pat Burrell mash taters. Yeah. And Jim Tomey, I guess, was the one who said that. But I'm, I'm dating us. Anyway, Chris would be like, yeah, we got time to go into the fast pitch. And you just like uncork the <laughs> 75 mile per hour heat. <laughs> I threw You're like a young man. 60 at the highest. That was it. But still. That was some cocky shit to be like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna I used to play use my free league. time. You don't forget. Yeah, we all, we all know you used to play little league, but that is still a public stage. That's Citizens Bank Park. Now, were you in the bullpen? No, no. But there were a lot of dudes around who would have let you know the boo birds, if you will. You know, That's so I true. feel like at a shoot, I could just see you at least looking the part. You know what I, I mean? I would just you turn to the be... guy next to me. I'd be like, you ever see heat? <laughs> <laughs> This is why you're good at parties. We can wrap it up there. I'm so excited to see what you have for the second half of this show. So, yeah, so this is interesting because this is, we're pre recording. Uh-huh. This is, you know, you're providing telehealth right now for a dying, a dying podcast. The right can of the watch. Yeah. You're going to be grouse hunting on vacation. And usually, though, when we record a bit, like a section, mm-hmm. it's just a section, but you opened the pot. So you've basically set the table, served the meal that people want. I know the Kaya, the dishes, and now you're like scissor scissor person that she is. She could cut out my intro if you just want to make this into no, like no. the second half. But I think that this no, no, this no. episode of industry warrants leading the pot. We're episode seven of the bear. No cuts. You know what I mean? <laughs> like we're, we're we're one take. We're showing everybody what we got. I know that I think that we never cut, but I do wonder how much Kaya cuts. It's true, do you, Chris. Do you ever listen to the Watch podcast? Rarely, very rarely. <laughs> Have you ever listened not to sure. an episode of The Watch? I'm not sure if I have. Is it good? I don't know. It depends on how I'm much you to, do. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for it to hit Patreon. What if, what Ka- if Bluey Kaya, what if we kids? go independent? You coming with us? Of course. I'll follow you guys anywhere. We don't Thanks, pay Kaya. well. By the way. But, <laughs> but we, know, we know a guy who's well, into telehealth. Then. What if, guys, what if Bluey all this time was the kids spinoff of Breaking Bad? And it was just about the meth, right? Is it? Do you think more people will look? What do you mean, is it? <laughs> it's like a metaphor? I'm just, you, you said, depends how much bluey you do, which definitely sounded like a metaphor. Uh, does, that does so, sound Craigslist-y. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, this has been an interesting conversation. Andy, uh, a have a lovely uh, week without me. I'll be back for Thrones at, at some point <laughs> in, the, in the near future. Chris, thanks for joining me for the last episode of The Watch. It's really been, <laughs> it's been a great run. We'll talk to you guys soon. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. You don't have to buy custom window treatments in person because Blinds.com invented a better way. Blinds.com is 100% online. There's no showroom markups or waiting hours for quotes from pushy salespeople. A Blinds.com designer helped me pick the perfect style for free. And Blinds.com shipped free samples right to my door. You can DIY or book a pro like I did with just one click. Best of all, everything's covered with the Blinds.com 100% satisfaction guarantee. Shop Blinds.com for up to 45% off. Rules and restrictions may apply. It's hard not to add a side of hot, crispy hash browns to your favorite McDonald's breakfast. It's even harder not to eat said hash browns before you get home. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Okay, guys. Well, Chris is enjoying some lobster rolls, maybe some summer ales. 
the humidity of the East Coast. You got me. And as I said at the top, we're going to talk a little bit about the new Amazon Prime series, A League of Their Own, which is streaming now, as well as the first episode of She-Hulk Attorney at Law, which just premiered on the Disney Plus Network. But before we get into that, I did want to digress a little. No, not about my weekend trip to Legoland, which was excellent, by the way. I don't care what the haters say. It's a very fun park. It's a very sweet park. And Actually, Mommingtons and Daddingtons out there, super pro tip that many of you already know. If and when your children ask, no, demand that you take them on a VR experience ride, you can just close your eyes. That's really all you have to do. You can just close your eyes and it really doesn't last long. And you can hear them screaming in delight or as I found out with my younger daughter, screaming in terror that her death was imminent. You're not going to get nauseous. You'll be fine. So that's my tip. But Aside from that, I did want to talk about something. I know that there's been some feedback. People have been asking us to talk about a certain show. I want you guys to know that uh, we hear you. We see you. I know that there's some desire for us to talk about it. But I guess I did also want to tell you this small anecdote, which doesn't entirely explain why we're not covering this show. You know, as you guys know, Chris is on vacation. Can't cover everything without him. His his voice matters. 50-50 split. But maybe it influences the decision a little. So set the scene for you guys. As you know, uh, I live in Los Angeles, California now after 17 years in Brooklyn. I've been here, if you ask me honestly, I would tell you I've been here for two years, maybe three tops, but that's what happens when you don't have seasons outside of for your consideration Emmy season and uh, also when there's a pandemic. So actually I've been here six years and Chris has been here shockingly uh, 10 years and we've been podcasters for, as you know, 10 years. We are by no means celebrities. We are not in any way famous. We are not, we are barely noteworthy. <laughs> As proof of that, if you ever Google us, check the picture that comes up for Chris Ryan. <laughs> we all love Chris. The CR heads know. But to this day, Wikipedia provides the image of a uh, very tough ex-military special ops British uh, fiction writer named Chris Ryan, who, by the way, should have been my special guest for today's solo portion of the pod. Anyway, what I wanted to say was, we don't matter except in one specific pocket of the universe. And that is roughly in the neighborhood of Silver Lake, in the Sunset Junction area, we are maybe C-plus listers. I have traveled the world. Occasionally someone will recognize me or someone will recognize Chris. I hear from him all the time. Some, for some reason, if we cross the street in the Sunset Junction area, people will shout all sorts of Baranski-related content from moving cars. It's flattering. It's nice. We'd love to meet you out in the world. Thank you for all of that. All of this is to not be a brag or a humble brag or any kind of brag. It's really just to set the scene that when I got a coffee the other week uh, at a local business, I'll shout it out, no free ads, but I love dinosaur coffee on Sunset. But when I, as I was sitting down with my coffee and my laptop to get a little work done, I saw something that was not unfamiliar to me. I saw the person who was sitting on the bench near where I was about to sit do the look and then the double look, and then back to his book. And I was like, oh, that's sweet. He, he fits the profile of a potential watch fan. Maybe he'll say something nice, or maybe he won't say anything at all. But my ego was like, hey, that, that's cool. That's cool. The guy knows who I am. So sitting there, getting a little work done on a script, enjoyed my coffee, time to go. I start to pack up, and I can feel the movement. I can feel the sort of nervous hesitation. I can feel the approach. And I'm like, this is, this is good. This is going to really boost my Tuesday. And uh, I look, lift my head up expectedly expectantly, you know, he's looking at me, he's looking a little bashful and he says something. I'm like, I'm, I'm so sorry. What, what was that? And he says, are you? And I start to nod and he says, are you Nathan Fielder? God damn it. So guys, this happens more than I would like to admit. I'd love to say this is on some level anti-Semitic. Don't think that's the case. I guess floppy haired 40 something Jews are, uh, you know, a rare sight out here in Hollywood. But I bring this up first because it's ridiculous and happens all the time to me now. But two, uh, we haven't covered the rehearsal because as much as I do admire and respect my apparent doppelganger, Nathan Fielder, I have a hard time with the comedy. I've watched two episodes of the rehearsal and it's not for me. It doesn't mean I'm saying it's good, not good. I'm not saying it's bad. I don't have a take. It is just something that I find extremely uncomfortable to watch. And the fact that it makes me so uncomfortable probably means it's worthwhile on some level, right? Like I'm having a reaction. Something is awake inside of me. I, I, I do not uh, crave the second screen experience because I'm bored, but rather so I could hide behind Wordle or whatever. 
but I don't feel like that's a take. So uh, Chris might come on and argue with me and debate with me about it, but that's why we haven't covered it thus far, because honestly, it, it's a challenge for me. And maybe we could have uh, my therapist on next week to discuss why that is. But so that's why we see your, we see your messages. Uh, Chris sees your tweets. You know, I'm purely a Facebook guy, really big into meta. I like to lean all the way in. Shouts to Sheryl Sandberg. But um, that's why we haven't covered it yet. Okay, but Nathan Fielder's The Rehearsal is streaming on HBO Max. Um, HBO Max in the news again this week because for industry heads, not the industry heads we just serviced with a loving, loving uh, deep dive into episode three of season two, but the industry heads who tune in just for streaming wars um, and Bob Watch know that HBO Max was in the news because layoffs were confirmed, basically. uh, Casey Bloys, who is still head of programming over there, um, did a reorg. A bunch of people, unfortunately, lost their jobs. But it was a sign of what a lot of people had predicted was coming with David Zaslav taking over, Discovery taking over, et cetera, et cetera. I can't really report anything here, but I can report uh, or at least convey that anecdotally, um, while a lot of the same people uh, are behind the scenes making decisions creatively, a lot of those creative decisions are definitely being affected by the new corporate structure. They're making fewer shows. A few years ago, there was a lot of talk, and we did a bunch of podcasts about how John Stanky and AT&T, when they took over HBO, were going to supersize it to compete with Netflix, and they were going to start greenlighting more shows and more content. And when HBO Max opened with its own programming team, you know, they were almost competing with each other uh, to put new shows on the air and give green lights. That is no longer the case. I think the windows for what they are making are, are shortening. Um, their pipeline is tightening again, and um, a lot of really interesting compelling original projects are just not getting made. And generally when these projects come from their in-house studio, Warner Brothers, and are sold or set up to be HBO or HBO Max and HBO or HBO Max says, sorry, we don't have room for it. We love this. We love you, but we have a competing project or we just don't have the budget for it. That means that project's dead. And that's a bummer. And I was thinking about that, not to put League of Their Own and She-Hulk attorney at law in any kind of negative light and not to repeat my monologue about the, you know, strident need for original content that I gave uh, when I was solo the other day. But it is a very weird moment. It's a very weird moment. And obviously, both of these shows are not original ideas, although they have originality in them. I'm having a hard time squaring the things that I'm hearing behind the scenes, the shows I'm seeing on the screen. And the third point of the triangle, the wild success of our favorite show of the year thus far, The Bear, with everything that I'm hearing. Now, The Bear was done at cost. You know, I think they did it pretty cheaply and quickly. um, And it's been a phenomenon for FX and for, uh, I guess, FX on Hulu. What is the lesson of that show behind the scenes at these cost-cutting streamers? Not just HBO Max, but we know Netflix is doing the same thing. Are they paying attention? Are they going to try to replicate it? What lessons are being learned from it? I don't know. I guess we probably won't know for 12 to 18 months, but it's something to keep an eye on. Because what I'm seeing with these shows that I'm now finally, I promise, going to talk about is less an idea so flamingly hot and exciting that it has to be made. Like it has an incandescence to it. And, you know, there are many shows that I would describe that way, certainly over the last 10, 15 years, not just some of our favorites from this year, like The Bear and Barry or Reservation Dogs. But, you know, that's, forget Better Call Saul, that was Breaking Bad, right? That was Vince Gilligan being like, I'm going to write whatever I want to write. Having, you know, worked for other people, this is what I want to do now. I'm seeing less of that on our screens and anecdotally behind the scenes. And I'm seeing more of smart, creative people strapping on their work boots and being like, okay, you've given me a box and I will do my best to fill this box with the things that motivate and interest me. And often the creator's success in filling that box is determined not necessarily by the creator's own spark or talent, actually certainly not, but more by what the box manufacturer will tolerate. And so this is all a very unromantic way of talking about Abby Jacobson's A League of Their Own, which... I, should have, I shouldn't have buried the lead. I really like a lot. So for people who don't know, the show is a, an original re-exploration, not a reboot really or a sequel, of the beloved now, and I can't even believe this, 30-year-old Penny Marshall film, A League of Their Own. And the premise is that during World War II, when our, uh, our, our boys were out fighting overseas, um, 
baseball te- professional baseball teams were fielded of women to give people something to watch and cheer for. And, you know, obviously attendant sexism and class issues were explored through that lens. Um, Abby Jacobson, one half of Broad City, has taken this on and taken this idea and made a an original show that is really noteworthy because it takes full advantage of the moment. Not full of necessarily full advantage of the medium, although it does do that. I mean, it's eight episodes that vary in length from 30 to 60 minutes. And so that's a lot more story than was in Penny Marshall's movie. But there's also a lot of other things that weren't in Penny Marshall's movie either, like a, a much more nuanced and uh, clear-eyed view of sexism as lived in the moment, of um, the illicit nature of same-sex relationships, both then and honestly, any time throughout history, and race as well. Um, Because unlike the original movie, this A League of Their Own really, really prominently places, and almost a a co-lead with Abby Jacobson, who plays a a catcher from Idaho named Carson Shaw, a phenomenal actress, in my opinion, Shantae Adams, who plays a character named Max Chapman, who is an ace pitcher, um, but for all the struggles that Carson and her all uh, and her pr- predominantly white teammates uh, receive in getting on the team, she has many more hurdles to climb. I say predominantly white because there's a character from Cuba, there's a character with Mex- from Mexican descent, but Max, being a black woman in this era, has considerably more hurdles to climb. So, what's interesting about the show, in some ways, is what's interesting to Abby, who I just like so much as a writer, as a performer. I just think she's awesome. Uh, as just a person in the world, honestly, great Instagram follow. It strikes me that she's less interested in the history of the moment, the world around this team, the Rockford Peaches, is nodded at, referred to obliquely. We we certainly get a sense that there is a war. We know that uh, Carson's husband is in the war. Some people, you know, it's a conversation of or about which men are actually uh, still in America at this point, certainly men of fighting age. But it doesn't really seem to motivate her in a large way. Um, and so far, I wouldn't say baseball does either, which is probably fine. Although I got to say, there is something in me that when you see baseball performed, I'm just kind of all in. I don't know whether that's the field of dreams, the natural, or just, you know, being a long suffering baseball fan myself. Like I love seeing it. And I think that um, Jamie Babbitt, who directed the first two episodes and the whole production team did a really good job of the baseball. Like they, they get the sound, the pop of the mitts. It's, it's a, it's a nice sensory experience, but um, all of this is kind of to say, the show is a really pleasant, it's a, a pleasant and thoughtful watch. It's almost a victim of this moment where, um, because it's an Amazon Prime series and it's a period piece and there's some names behind it and there's some interesting politics involved in it, it that it carries with it almost a necessity to be eventized. I mean, how else are you going to get noticed in this crowded landscape? When in fact, its rhythms are a little more old fashioned. It's very charming. It's very pleasant to watch. The uh, stakes of the second episode, well, very large in the sense of young women existing in the world that hates, disrespects, and fears them. The specific stakes for Max, uh, the character I'm referring to, played by Shantae Adams, and her best friend Clance, who's played by a British actress whom I've never encountered before, who I think is absolutely incredible, named um, Bemisola Ikumelo. She is unreal. She's so good. I think she was just announced as a member of the cast of the Roadhouse reboot. So I feel like that's probably a good thing for her. Anyway, their stakes in the second episode is they have to locate, purchase, and secure a bucket of crabs for a crab boil. Now, admittedly, I think finding fresh shellfish in 1940s Illinois would present anyone with a challenge. So I don't begrudge them that. But, you know, it is relatively small bore up to this point. Um, What does seem to motivate Abby, and I don't want to speak for her, I would love it if she would come on the podcast again, really is the idea of young women having dreams and dreams being deferred. And also, um, you know, there's a a, a beautiful and burgeoning relationship between her character, Carson Shaw, who I mentioned is married to a soldier serving overseas, and the great Darcy Carden, who you know from The Good Place, and Barry, who plays Greta, a kind of glamorous and confusing uh, fellow member of the Rockford Peaches. That romance really motivates the story as well. I'm in. I really like the show, but I can't help but think that this is... I can't decide, basically. I've seen two episodes, so it's not up to me to decide yet. But Abby is so clearly impassioned by certain things, and I guess I'm wondering two episodes in if this is the best possible box for it, or if this is just one box 
that she's going to fill now and then continue to do more work in the future? It doesn't have to be an existential question. It's just something that um, I guess I'm curious about. I will also say that the other thing that she doesn't seem to have total fidelity to is period. Well, the costumes are great and um, the cars and everything. The characters um, definitely speak as if they were written in 2022, which also is fine. I feel like period pieces written in the 70s, people probably spoke like they spoke in the 70s, but now the 70s are a period piece too. But I feel, though I'm not an American historian, I do feel secure saying that people probably didn't say things like, one billion percent or literally one billion percent. I don't think they said things like that then, but it doesn't matter. It's a fun exploration of a time and a moment. And uh, Nick Offerman is in it playing this show's version of the Tom Hanks role, brilliant casting. And there's a surprise of that character in the second episode that I did not see coming and ran against some of my skepticism. So I took that as a really, really good sign and one that makes me interested in watching the rest of the series. So League of Their Own, Amazon Prime's uh, streaming now. Then, guys, we got to talk about She-Hulk Attorney at Law. And I don't know, guys. <laughs> They've made one episode. One episode is up. Uh, Disney and Marvel do not provide screeners. I know they do to some people. They do not to me. Maybe I think they definitely won't after I talk about this show now. I want to speak gently and carefully about it because what I feel about the show and the negativity that I carry about the show is in no way directed at the very talented people who made the show or who are starring in the show. Nobody sets out to make something bad. Nobody sets out to make something that just seems not confusing, but confused. Um, those things happen to projects. And the feeling I got from watching this first episode is that oh gosh, people tried really hard and something happened to this. And what happened to it is what Marvel is in 2022. And it's a bummer. It's a bummer. I, I feel like if you off the record went up to a lot of people involved in the show and just asked them, said, you know, you've got the Infinity Gauntlet, you could snap your fingers and they could do a re they could get another shot at it, another bite at the apple, a redo, or maybe just memory hole it. Would they do it? I kind of feel like they would. That's again, I'm not trying to read people's minds. I'm not trying to put down people's work, but the press rollout for the show has been really interesting. And, and maybe Chris and I will talk about it a little bit more when he gets back. But Jessica Gao, who is a writer on Rick and Morty and other programs who created this and is show running it and wrote it, has been pretty loose in the interviews in a way that I really appreciate. And it makes me think very highly of her, quite honestly. And I wonder what Kevin Feige and the rest of Marvel think about it because, you know, she's been very honest being like, you know, we wanted to do a legal show and then we got the room together and we realized we're not very good at writing a legal show. So we didn't do that. Oh, okay. I kind of respect that. But she's also saying things like the version of She-Hulk, a really funny, surprisingly great character in comics that she fell in love with is the same version that I fell in love with. And I think a lot of other people did, which was this run on the character um, written and drawn by a now kind of controversial, I guess, but but generally pretty highly regarded, certainly in his peak a uh, comic creator named John Byrne, in which She-Hulk was, it was, a, it was a legal comedy. Yes, she was also a Hulk, but it was a lighthearted comedy that broke the fourth wall. She talked to the reader. And that was kind of, I don't know if it was unheard of, but it was unexpected at a time when comic books were, this is the late 80s and the early 90s when comic books were getting serious. That was the era of Sandman, which I talked about last week, but also the era of Bam Pow comics. They're not just for kids anymore headlines that used to dominate. Um, anyway, the fourth wall breaking is in this show, like twice, and then it's kind of not there. And she talks about a lot of other things that aren't there either. And most glaringly, what she talks about is how the pilot isn't the pilot that they wrote and shot. The pilot is a piece of the pilot that they wrote and shot, and then a huge, huge chunk of the finale that they surgically dropped into the pilot and you can feel it. And the reason why they did it is kind of a bummer. The reason why they did it is because it was determined. And again, she doesn't say who determined this. So we can actually just say Marvel collectively that the audience wasn't ready to accept the show that they had all agreed to make, which is that Tatiana Maslany, one of our great actors, certainly TV performers of the decade, the show that she, I'm sure, signed up to be in about 
a young woman who is a really good lawyer and then also happens to be a Hulk, that the audience wouldn't accept it. They wouldn't understand it. They needed, drum roll please, an origin story. And so what we get is the beginning of the legal comedy they want to make. And then she turns to the camera and says, I know that you're going to watch a legal comedy, but I guess we should tell you about what happened. And then there's this 20 minute thing with Mark Ruffalo and there's a car crash with a spaceship and some blood gets on her. And then they're in Mexico getting drunk and fighting and wistfully reminiscing about Tony Stark. And guys, what? What is it? It's not a show, really. It's just some content stitched together to make people feel better about committing to something that we don't even know what it is yet. It, to me, it's the worst of all possible solutions because they didn't have the confidence to give us something new, which to its enormous credit, credit that only grows greater, honestly, in hindsight, WandaVision did do. WandaVision didn't start with a black and white sitcom, have, have Agatha pause the screen, wink, and remind us what Vision and Scarlet Witch were up to or where they came from, it committed to the bit. And I'm not sure what it is about this project or where we are in comic book storytelling that made them squirrely or nervous. They're making so much content. They're making so much TV. They can't white knuckle control everything like this anymore. They're going to have to let some shows be what not just what they want to be, but what their creators clearly intended them to be. They can't all just be retroactively whittled down and reshaped and retconned into being widgets of the larger phase five colossus. It's not going to work. It's not just, we're past seeing the seams, guys. We're hearing the snapping tendons. Like it's, it's an awkward, awkward thing. And what's heartbreaking to me about it isn't just that I'm super into the let's just go for it comic book absurdity of a sitcom on Disney Plus called She-Hulk Attorney at Law. Tatiana Maslany can do this. You know, you didn't cast her just to maybe be in Thunderbolts in four years. That's not why she's here. She has better things to do if that's why she's here. Come on. There's a moment here in that Mexico sequence when she delivers to, and I want to say Mark Ruffalo, but I assume it's just a couple of ping pong balls in Atlanta. The what I imagine was the core of Jessica Gao's pitch here, which is that you, Bruce Banner, you don't need to tell me, a young professional woman, about what it's like to control your anger and fear. I live like that every day, as do all women in the world. That's a universal idea. That's a great idea. That is an engine of an idea that can fuel any sort of TV show, whether it has gamma rays in it or not. And the fact that it's there. It almost felt like a proof of life video or like a like a Morse code ping from the bottom of the ocean. There's life here, you know? There's heart here. There are a lot of talented people involved. Ginger Gonzaga is in this, uh, in a small part at least, maybe more to come. Renee Elise Goldsberry, Tim Roth is around the corner, and of course, Benedict Wong and Charlie Cox. Um, by the way, I would love to just get Benedict Wong's travel records from the last year. Did he just... Did they buy him an open-ended ticket to Atlanta and just run him through what we used to call ESPN the car wash, where like an athlete would show up in Bristol and then he he or she would film like 10 TV shows and podcasts over the course of an afternoon? Is that what he did? Because I'm always happy to see him, but it's incredible the way the usage rate on this guy. Um, No, there's a spark here, you know, and the fact that this first episode had to be this is a bummer to me. Now, I only saw one. The fact that they got this out of the way with the dodgy CGI and the Hulk versus Hulk fight that I guess someone somewhere thought that people wanted is the fact that that's out of the way a good thing? Okay. I'm going to say, yeah, it's a good thing. I'm going to be optimistic here because I would rather see the comedy that this wants to be, even if it falls flat on its face, than see this fearful backtracking mishmash of I'm not even sure what anymore you know and I know I listen this is the raw and cut usually Chris is here to make better jokes than I can do right now and um I know there's an element of our listenership that's just like look this is what it is now but I wish it wasn't I wish it wasn't you know I like comic books I like She-Hulk I like 
WandaVision and Loki. I like Marvel movies. And I like anything that is allowed to be the best version of itself. And, you know, I think for for whatever flaws it has, A League of Their Own is doing that. Um, do I wish it was an original story that Abby Jacobson could write about a young woman living her dream and living her truth and with a great ensemble cast that only someone of her caliber could attract? Yeah, I do. I wish it was something else, quite frankly, but it's not. This is the world we live in. And so I'm pretty happy with what it is because at least it is living its truth. Free She-Hulk. That's what we're ending on. So that's my rant for today. Programming note, I believe... Maybe our dogged producer, Kaya McMullen, who is definitely second screening while I monologue can remind me. I think Chris is going to be back for at least one show next week. I think we are, because we are both traveling, taking off next Thursday. So there will be only one new episode of The Watch next week. Guys, it's House of the Dragon time. Have Chris and I already seen it? Listeners, you're going to have to tune in next week to find out. Such a pleasure talking to you about how People don't recognize me anymore. They just think I'm Nathan Fielder. What a headline. What a headline. Thanks to Kaya for putting up with me and for producing. Thanks to Chris for having a killer vacation and coming back tanned, rested, and ready so we can hit the ground running and get back to Westeros where we belong. Have a great weekend, everybody. Have a great, great weekend, Christine Baranski. <laughs> 